And we are live. We are back with the fifth episode of our Peaky Podcast of Season 1 of... I have much to say again, the Peaky Blinders podcast <laughs> on the Story Archives Network here. I'm Mario alongside... Zachary. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. What's up, Zach? Zach, I take back my words from the last episode. <laughs> take it back. I said this was my least favorite episode, maybe in all of Peaky Blinders. I take it completely back. I forgot how good this episode was. Yeah, when you started talking about it, uh, well, the last episode, I was like, yeah, you know, I... I don't really remember much of that. It must not be good. And then I watched it, and I'm like, oh, I don't know what he was talking about. This is actually pretty good. So The only thing that I will say that stays consistent here is that I still cannot stand uh, Shelby Sr., Arthur Shelby Sr. is like, well, he's literal walking cancer, that guy. He's still a prick. Like, I mean... Is he, is he in Sons of Anarchy? You know, he Did looks like it. Yeah. I, I can look okay. it up. Yeah, I think I think he is. Let's look that up. Um, we need a fake since we haven't made it yet, Zach. Because mm-hmm. we're not like a famous podcast or anything mm-hmm. like that. We don't have an assistant that looks stuff up for us that or anything like that. Awesome. So can we have an imaginary assistant and then you chime in like he can't talk? Yeah, I'll just be like, uh, yeah, so and so just uh, just told me that uh, you know his name will be Arthur. Actors. His name will be Arthur. Arthur. Actually, Jimmy. What do you think, Jimmy? Jimmy. Ah, uh, Jimmy could work. I like Jimmy. Jimmy could work. Jimmy. I like Jimmy. Right. Well, any, right. anyways, Arthur, Arthur Sr. is played by a guy named Tommy Flanagan, who is Philip Telford in Sons of Anarchy. Okay. I knew he was in Sons of Anarchy. Although, I haven't watched it. My dad's a big fan, but uh, I, I personally haven't watched all in... of it. I watched a f- little bit of it, like, wi- like literally yeah. in, like, 2010, because my cousin watched it all the time. Yeah. But it, it was pretty decent, from what I remember. I thought you had like a fantasy about being a biker, like an outlaw biker. That was, that was like not a thing. Not a fantasy. No, I just I want to get an Indian motorcycle, the bobber scout oh, okay. at some or scout bobber at some point. Yeah, I, re- I recall something about like a drug racket and you being like a, a biker, but whatever. No, no, no. That that was point. that was like ten years ago. It wasn't a fantasy. Oh, oh shit! All right, well, uh, let's get <laughs> let's get started with this episode then. <laughs> <laughs> I was just joking with somebody today because they, they uh, I can't even remember what they said. They're like, I thought they said, oh, you're a strangler. And I'm like, no, but it's been a while since I've killed somebody. <laughs> <laughs> How does that happen? Like, what is the context of that conversation? Well, they didn't actually say strangler. I just thought I heard them say strangler or something along those lines. But they were just like. Uh, congratulating that, me on something that I had said because it gave them an idea, and they're like, "Oh, thanks." I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. you had a an, you had an American Psycho moment when he's talking about mergers and acquisitions. Yeah, it's true. You've never seen that movie, but somebody who out there has American Psycho, they'll laugh. I've seen they'll American Psycho. They'll, they'll chuckle. They'll chuckle at that joke. All right, so episode five opens up with Tommy visiting a peculiar grave of a man whose name I do not recognize. Daniel, Daniel Owen. Owen. I didn't recognize it either. I. I, yeah, I, yeah. I should have for some reason. I feel yeah, like, but yeah. I didn't. Well, but the way he's acting in this scene immediately, I kind of knew the direction this was going in because he's looking around as if somebody's watching him, and well, so he's, he's immediately the assumptions him come. Him, right? Yeah, but here particularly, he is alone, so yeah. I, I have a feeling that the grave is the site for the guns. That's my, that was my initial impression. All right, all right, fair enough. Yeah, uh, we get a look pretty much. Of what's going on with everybody in the in the entryway, and we see Polly bringing a care package to Ada and her child in a very dingy, cold room. You can see just how cold it is. Even the lighting's kind of like cold and bluish. It's and so it's really dark. It does feel cold. Yeah, she's she's living in complete uh, poverty and just tr- struggling to take care of this baby alone, pretty much just out of her own code of ethics. But um, I don't think she can last that long until she does something to. Uh, support her child because we get the next look at Freddie and he's oh he's beat pretty the much crap. bloody and battered in prison yeah yeah he's not looking too get, hot yeah you get the sense here that Paulie's needed more than ever in, in Ada's life at this point yeah you know also in this episode you kind of see this resentment towards Tommy on multiple levels mm-hmm. it's not it feels like they're taking the Freddie thing and they're just willingly choosing not to believe tommy because really how he hasn't really shown to be disloyal at any point in season one so it just seems to me like 
Not yeah. to family. Yeah, to family or friends. I mean, look what he does with Danny Wisbang with That's the sheep's true. brains, right? That's true. So he's dealing with the scorn and resentment, and Paulie's just refusing to believe him. So I think it's kind of playing out. Their frustrations with Tommy mm-hmm. and the lead he's taken, it's, it's playing out, and they're really just stretching this shit out, you know? Yeah. We get a look at the new relationship with Grace and Tommy way more in this episode. It's like the first episode that actually delves deeper into that. And mm-hmm. we actually see a side of Tommy where he is confiding in Grace with things that he's not even telling his family. Yeah. Such as when he writes that Black Star in the diary system that Grace has going mm-hmm. and tells her that that's Black Star Day, the day that they're, they're going gonna to take, take out him. Kimber and his men. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, speaking of Grace in this episode, you know, like I've always been saying up to this point, I've never been a fan of Grace, and I, I did not like her. This is, it's in this episode that that my that my opinion begins to change. Yeah. And I, I like towards the end of this episode, I actually enjoy her character a lot more. I won't I won't get into why. I mean, we'll we'll we'll, we'll hear yeah. about that a little later. Maybe because this is my third rewatch of um, of Peaky Blinders, or I think it's my third rewatch of Peaky Blinders, but. I'm noticing something from Tommy here where he says his family hates him because Grace asks, you know, did you tell your family about Black Black Star Day or whatever it's mm-hmm. called? Um, why would I tell and he them? says, why would I tell my family? They all hate me. Yeah. So Tommy's kind of playing the pity card here. But in reality, I think Tommy's getting to a place in his life where he realizes that, that he's not going to be able to have a closeness mm-hmm. with anyone in his family the way he's going to be able to have a closeness with Grace, for example. Mm-hmm. Right? Or a love interest in general. Yeah. Because everybody has their different agendas. You're seeing the way that they're stretching this thing out. And you see in this next scene with Arthur and John going to this fighting ring where John is resentful of his brother. When we're just coming off of an episode where he admits to uh, just pretty much wanting to make his brother proud. Right? Yeah. Granted, I understand why John would be a little bit resentful having been arranged the marriage. But <laughs> es- Esme's a looker, so I don't, you know. I mean, he seemed pretty win-win. happy at the end of the episode. So I don't know what he's crying about. Yeah. Um, where are John's kids in this episode? Are they anywhere in sight? It's a great question. I haven't seen any of his four. I'm sure they're lovely yeah. kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyways, the John and Arthur are showing up to this illegal fighting ring and pretty much coming to get their piece for the, for the Peaky Blinders. But uh, what they don't expect to happen is running into their father, who is very coincidentally placed inside of this fighting ring and mm-hmm. you know wrecking havoc on everybody uh there's already a focus with arthur and his love for his dad because of just the the shots the close-up shots of his eyes looking at him yeah and he's named after the man yeah, i was gonna say his, his dad's name yeah. is the same it's arthur shelby yeah. senior but you know yeah tell me the actor who's who plays their father isn't a great you know casting just he's he's, oh, he's just great. so grizzled looking he's got yeah. the scars across his mouth like it's just a He's an intimidating guy. He is. And, I mean, he's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah. Well, he, you kind of wish that he had kind of a more so. present uh, role on the show, you know? Yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, I was just saying he was also in Braveheart a while back, too. So, I mean, he, he's, like, oh, got he, this yeah. warrior, fighter sort of look going on, too. Yeah. You don't want well, to well, mess with him. Definitely not. But um, after the fighting ring, he ends up, they invite him back to the house for a meal. And he's received well by Arthur. Arthur's trying to kind of smooth the rough waters over with that the rest of the family has. You see Polly scoff when, he, when he's praying over his meal. And you see John pretty much protecting Finn from, from his dad. And uh, they essentially break the news to the father that Arthur's actually not the boss of the family. It's, it's Tommy. And... Uh, that's who walks in last in this scene and immediately tries to kick out his dad. And you kind of like, I'm with Tommy and John in the scene, but yeah. you know, you you have to have some empathy for Arthur, where Tommy's talking about, you know, we needed you ten years ago and you walked out on us, and now you're back, because he's clearly back. It's a very convenient timing that they just got their legal gambling license mm-hmm. and uh, or bookmaking license, and now. Uh, he's essentially just sh- pops back up out of the blue. Yeah, you know? it's it's uh, interesting timing. I wonder how long you he, notice- if he was even here that long, or if, I don't know. Yeah, well, do you notice that he really only tries to make a play at Arthur and Finn? Because yeah, I mean, he he's you know he kind of rubs Finn's head. Oh, you know, they're both like the weakest minded of the two, of the three. Yeah, but 
Arthur does have his strengths where John has his weaknesses, where Arthur is more loyal than John is in a sense, right? Yeah. Uh, he stick. He's the only one sticking up for Tommy in this whole bit with Freddie Thorne. Mm-hmm. And Arthur, I think everybody can agree, Arthur knows that Tommy is strong where he's weak, and he's strong where Tommy's weak, you know? Yeah, you know? I mean, they do make a good pair. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. going to deny that. Yeah. Anyways, we have uh, we have Arthur walking into the garrison, you know, grabbing some money, talking to Grace here. Yeah, yeah. it's it's uh yeah. I mean, I I wouldn't mind having a little place I can run into and just you know grab a drink off my shelf, grab some cash, yeah, and walk fantastic, out. Yeah, it's fantastic. Right? Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> I still the think we should garrison open up like our that? own. Yeah, we should open up our own bar or something like this at some point. Yeah, I'm down. Let's yeah. do it. What's called the garrison? I, it would be a hit if you saw if you call it the garrison. Yeah, you call it the garrison, well, and then you sell drinks named after the actors or the that would be characters. Great. Right? That'd be great. Get the Tommy the Shelby. Shelby. <laughs> yeah, Tommy Shelby, the Shelby Company Limited. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you see, Arthur, you kind of see the plot already taking place with his dad, mm -hmm. where he's going to take some money from the register, and you know it's for him. But um, Arthur does another kind of like loose-lipped moment with Grace. He has another one of those here where he's he lets it slip that. Um, the person that they're sending 10 pounds a week to in London is Danny Wisbang. Yeah. And he pretty much, you know, tells Grace that, yeah, he's not dead. And that grave that Tommy visits is not, uh, there's no, there's no body in there, or at least it's not the body of Danny Wisbang. Mm -hmm. So Grace continues to prod with questions of then who is in there. And Arthur, uh, pretty much tells her to just get her nose out of where it doesn't belong and gives her some money to shut up. Yeah. Don't you think, I mean, I guess Arthur at this point kind of just trusts Grace, but it's so blind. It's just the trust is so blind well, for their type of operation. And considering the weight of f what would happen if those I, weapons are found, I, because I, at this point it's kind of like, you know, you're 85% sure the weapons are there. Yeah, I, I agree. But I, I feel like I've been saying since episode one, like, it, it's not the only one that really surprises me out of this. Like, I don't want to say false sense of trust or anything, but... It's just too easy, right? It's it's Tommy. Like, I, I've always felt like he's just being too foolish. Like, Arthur, he's just, he's kind of thick. He's not he's not very bright. It, it, not at this point in here. Not with what we've seen. So it doesn't surprise me at all. Like, to me, it's not out of character for him. He's he, he's not thinking through things. He's not a leader or a strategic per. Well, he's not a leader in the sense of, like, you know, a strategic uh, sort of leader. Yeah. Tommy, on the other hand, well, who's all about strategy, right? You know, he's always thinking through. He's always trying to be like two, three, four steps ahead of the other guy. I just like, I don't feel like he should have jumped to trusting her so quickly. You know, she has taken some, you know, she has kind of proven herself in ways, you know, she continues to prove herself in ways, but um, man is, you know, you've, Fall for a pretty woman, and that's it, man. That's yeah. it. All your strategy goes out the window, even for Tommy Shelby. Apparently. <laughs> so, um, where did we leave off here? We have Arthur heading off to go give money to his deadbeat dad, and Grace being nosy, this nosy sleuth <laughs> who goes to the <laughs> who goes to the grave of Daniel Owen, and she knows she knows the guns are here that's that's pretty much the gist of this scene you know it's a really cheap looking grave when compared to everything it is else. right it's, and it's also like, very small looking yeah it sticks right it's it's a yeah it's a cross made out of wood everything else is stone and nice yeah it's, i don't know well arthur meets uh arthur senior at uh at a bar where now, finn the, finn just happens to be why is finn I, here another great scene? question right this is this is where they uh they fight here it, it's the why uh, fighting on earth ring. They allow, why would they allow Finn to be here in this? In this, it's like an illegal underground fighting ring with beer. I mean, over I'm under sure is I'd Finn ten? Is he ten years old? I don't know. Let's let's um, <clears throat> let's ask Jimmy. Because the dad, yeah, Jimmy, uh, look up if Finn is ten years old here. Um, I'm really just wondering because if the dad left ten years ago, and that would make Finn over 10 years old right because he would have had to have at least impregnated his wife before then right so anyways so J besides Jimmy's, my thin age theories i mean jim is telling me right now that um 
Finn is 11 years old in the, in yeah. the first season, yeah. I, I mean, it's still a little, little still a little young for, uh, you know, drinking and illegal fighting. He looks really little, man. He like, does I look think the really casting tiny. here is completely off. If he's supposed Must to be, be like eleven, I I agree. Eleven? I was like, I mean, I'm taller than the average, but I was near. I must have been five eight, like at eleven. I don't know. Like, I definitely wasn't that little. Yeah, I know. Neither was I. This kid looks like he's yeah. like seven. <laughs> <laughs> anyways that kid is probably our age by now if he continues to age like he does in the show true but um arthur senior gives an obnoxious pitch about casino starting in america and really just plays that whole division line with arthur mm-hmm. and it, arthur being kind of feeble-minded and under the influence of some alcohol here you know He's going along with his dad's plans, per usual. I think he feels kind of like this inferiority complex to Tommy, which, you know, kind of natural, right? Yeah, I mean, when when you're the oldest and you're supposed to be in charge of of business and everything, right? And, and you, you're yeah. not. And you've also, like, fallen apart with your uh, Flanders blues and all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, you're going you're gonna to want to seek approval anywhere you can get it, right? Yeah. Well, of course, the night couldn't be a normal night with them just exchanging, having some drinks. Uh, I guess Arthur Sr. just had the desire to bare fist brawl his son. And uh, they proceed to beat the shit out of each other and have just a very awkward, heartfelt moment at the end of the fight. It's very awkward. It's it's one of the the few moments that I felt like I needed to to cringe or wince looking at the screen here. It's, it's, It's a little weird. This is my son, <laughs> Arthur Shelby, and he can fight any of you. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. There's a lot of people I, I wish I could, uh, I could, uh, you know, have a have a fun time with like this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just know when you're having a good old brewski, you just want to beat the hell out of each yeah, other, right? Yeah, it happens. I mean. I love you, Dad. <laughs> Thanks for beating the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a different, it's a different upbringing. Oh, yeah. it's totally different. I don't get it. All right. So this next scene came out of nowhere. Came out of nowhere. And in my opinion, perhaps the most intense scene Mm -hmm. of all of season one so far. Uh, And it's when a character named Byrne visits Tommy at the garrison and begins to say things about his cousin Ryan, uh, who visited Tommy earlier with that. uh, Speaking of cringe scenes, the the singing IRA members in the bar a couple of episodes ago. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this guy, apparently that guy was connected, and he wasn't just talking crap under under the whiskey spell. And uh, Burns letting him know that was my cousin. And you get the sense here that this man is like an actual serious adversary to Tommy. Like, mm-hmm. in my opinion, I get the vibe that he's more of a serious adversary than even Campbell is. Like oh, he, the same here. Yeah, like, uh, he's almost equal status with Tommy, in my opinion, in terms of seeing through his BS and pretty much... Yeah, he is the king of the negotiations here because he drives the whole thing his way. Mm-hmm. Um, so they pretty much go back in this verbal subtextual uh, battle, I'd say, where Tommy concedes and has a private sit down with him. Where Byrne essentially, you know, long story short, says that he's going to pass judgment on Tommy for killing his cousin uh, cousin by the way i i left out the fact that his cousin was actually the i remember that grace shot yeah in the alleyway. That, that was a very important bit i thought you were going to circle yeah. around to it so i was like i'll give him a minute yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i forgot about that which you know makes you wonder does tommy know that grace killed him because i don't think he does um because he why why not just say that you didn't kill him which he does but he doesn't really tommy never when he tells you he didn't do something, he's not going to say it four times that he didn't do it. Yeah. He's going to tell you once he didn't do it, and then he's going to deal with the repercussions of the stupidities that you're going to do yeah. for not believing him. That's true. Right? Very true. So in this back and forth with, um, Burn with Byrne, and Tommy. yeah, he's pretty much just listening to him, and he is really being taken to the ringer here about all the fingers being pointed at him for having the guns. Yeah. And uh, Tommy knows that if he doesn't give this man these guns, he's going to die or this guy's going to bring war on all of them with the, with the full power of the IRA. So he concedes at the end of this conversation that the guns have become a burden to him. 
and it's time that he unloads them, which is by far, I think, the biggest concession Tommy has ever made in a negotiation and a competition. I, I completely agree. Uh, although, I mean, he's kind of backed into a corner here, right? He, you have Danny, who's talking too much in the bar. You've got the, mm-hmm. the, the IRA members working at the BSA factory and at the police station all pointing their fingers at Tommy. You, you kind of yeah. don't really have anywhere to go or a lane to stand on at this point, unless you just yeah, want all that if, war. It, if he would have hung on to his pride here, I think there's a whole different ending to this episode, if you think about it. Perhaps oh, yeah. a blown up garrison. Um, let me ask you this: What is a water and cordial? You know, I was wondering. I almost looked it up. I think it's it's a cordial, but uh, well, you don't do it. That's why we pay Jimmy. Nah, I'm, hey, I'm, um, I'm asking. Ask Jimmy real quick. Yeah, hey Jimmy, can you please look up what a water and cordial is? Yeah, yeah, sure thing, boss. <laughs> I hear him <laughs> typing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Jimmy, do you have an answer on what a water and cordial is? Uh, so, I mean, generally they're just made up of uh, water and, and a cordial. And that's that That seems to be about it. Uh, he's telling it's me cordial, usually uh, it's carbonated water, but yeah. The cordial has no liquor? Um, what is that? I, I don't know. Jimmy? <laughs> Uh, he's telling me it's it's an invigorating and stimulating preparation that is intended for medical purposes, basically. Oh, wow. So I'm Damn, Jimmy, that is a very intense definition. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it kind of sounds to me like this is just something, you know, you might mix in for flavor, like basil or some random thing like that. I have no idea. Got it. So Burns doesn't drink alcohol is what I'm getting here. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess not. You can see here where Tommy... You know, he conceded those weapons to uh, to burn. But he immediately does something out of character where he goes to Campbell, mm-hmm. essentially, to kind of help him out and tries to play it both ways. But it's kind of a weak move by Tommy here because, you know, Campbell cannot be trusted. Mm-hmm. So and he's asking Campbell to essentially by turning in burn and, a co- and by turning in burn as being a member of the IRA. He's asking to have his name left out that he was involved in it at all, which is not going to happen. No, right? Not at all. Um, but, Tommy's I mean, also at the same time trying to get to the bottom of who gave up Freddie Thorne. Yeah, and Campbell's not going to be stupid enough to say that it was Grace, but we know it was Grace at this point, right, Zach? Uh, I mean, we know it's Grace. Tommy doesn't know it's yeah. Grace, but Campbell tells Tommy, "Well, don't you know everybody in the city knows it was you?" Yeah, it's kind of just mocking him, right? Yeah. Uh, Arthur continues <laughs> to take money and take it to his father. And he's just really in a weak spot. But I think you also have to sympathize with Arthur a bit because out of all of the brothers, he would have lived with the father the longest. So perhaps he actually mm-hmm. had some good times with him, right? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, although I don't think the age gap between Tommy and Arthur is significant. I would have to say it's at least, what, five years? I don't know. I mean, it's, you it's think possible. it's less than that? Because Arthur looks way older than Tommy, in my opinion. I mean, Arthur looks older, but I don't think he's that much older. Yeah. Well, if they say Arthur's 25, then uh, I'm done because he looks like he is at least 40 or 38. Disagree? Hmm. I mean, Tommy's technically supposed to be like a 22-year-old kid probably coming back from war, if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they, we, we know the Peaky Blinders were all young anyways, right? So they can't be that old to begin with. Yeah. yeah. Anyways. Yeah, well, after his deal with Campbell, you have Tommy hurriedly coming back to the garrison where you have Grace waiting for him there. And he's actually, you can tell Tommy's just in like uh, improvising because he actually asked Grace to take part yeah. in this plan here where he's going to have two IRA members come in. And once he gives them what they want, he thinks that they're going to turn around and actually kill him. So he wants grace to be kind of a decoy in order for him to, I guess to pretty much buy time for the police to come in and ambush them. Yeah. So, well, I mean, he gives grace a, to- a gun, right? And he has a little one too. So I just think he wanted to keep, keep guns on them so they didn't do anything until the cops showed up. Yeah. Yeah. And we see the, you know, he has a plan with the with the bells tolling that the cops should be coming in. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we see how it plays out, 
you know, some of these plans sometimes, even that if they are well planned, which this one is not, it's very hurriedly planned from the way the episode makes you feel. Yeah. Uh, that sometimes things go wrong, and um, Burns does show up with his with his fellow Goonies. singing IRA <laughs> member. Uh, this is the that's the singer. Now oh, I don't remember really? the one who got shot. Yeah, that's the one who sings. I don't remember that. Yeah, I forgot I remember, about that. I don't remember. And he pushes away the whiskey this time, even though. Oh, yeah. Uh, he lost your thirst, he was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that line when Tommy tells it to him. That's great. Where you have uh, an intense negotiation between the two of them where Tommy shares the supposed location of the guns. Mm-hmm. And uh, the singing IRA member hands him a wad of cash, which looks like way too little. It really for does. For a whole arsenal of guns, right? Yeah, it does. I was expecting like a briefcase. Same. But when, <laughs> that's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. Like, that doesn't seem like enough. But then again, it's like it's trying to sell like a stolen object. Yeah. Anyways, we have the uh, the IRA member who we know from the previous episode singing, pulling out, yeah. you know, a little little really wimpy pistol. It probably holds like a couple rounds. Somebody, somebody needs to make an edit where uh, <laughs> the IRA member starts singing in the middle of the negotiation where we do like a, like a kind of cross chop <laughs> of him singing. And everyone kind of just looking awkwardly at him. We need one of those. <laughs> well, uh, they end up doing exactly what Tommy thinks they would do, and they pull a gun on him after the negotiation. Mm-hmm. And uh, they allow Tommy one final toast, which is a sig- signal to Grace. But instead of Grace coming out and following instructions and pointing the gun at like these he men, would want yeah. Well, actually, I think she ended up doing the right thing because I think Tommy dies if she doesn't do this. Uh, she ends up coming out and pointing a gun and shooting the singing IRA member. Yeah. Uh, which leads to Tommy and Burns fighting to the death, where Tommy has like this kind of really well done and well filmed and well edited PTSD episode. Oh yeah, where uh, he he remembers being suffocated in or suffocating somebody in the in the mining shaft mm-hmm. of World War One, and he's essentially just kind of has this primal instinct kicked in where he, he punch, hits him in the groin and then flips over and bashes his head in with this water jug. Which was, you know, oddly like a satisfying thing because Burns is a smug piece oh, of crap. Oh, I know. He's so, like, so cocky. Right? <laughs> yeah. He deserves it. You know, it. Where's, where's Grace here, by the way? Like, I understand that she loses the gun, like it gets hit out of her hand. Uh huh. But is she really out for the count like that? Like, I come on, Grace. You got to get up. I mean, she's probably yeah. in shock more than anything else. I mean, I think it, it would have been a little anticlimactic for her to take out both guys. Like, yeah, Tommy's got to handle I, one, I, he, right? He's got to take care of one. I mean, she's already killed yeah. two people in the first season. I think she's killed more people than anybody else here <laughs> uh, yeah. in this first season. So you know, he's got to yeah. he's got to take one. I really do like how this scene was edited with the with the like, flashbacks yeah. to the mining shaft. Like, just really well done. It's just not over the top. You know what I mean? It's very yeah. subtle. It is. It it, it they could have made it a lot, a lot more intense. But uh, no, it's good. How about the two headbutts Tommy hits him with, huh? And the first one I get. The second one, I don't know if I'd go in the twice second, for a headbutt. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's sad. I think there's oddly satisfying when you headbutt someone. It's like I am willing to literally pound you with my like a sensitive part yeah. of, like that I can t- get hurt by. It's like an yeah. ultimate dominance yeah. of just like literally bashing someone's head in with your own head. No, it is. It's, uh, in, it's, it's not a bad technique. <laughs> People are going to uh, think but, of a cycle. But you got to do it this. once, right? You, you can only do it once because you do it to stun them, right? It's a surprise. Yeah. You're not expecting a punch yeah. to come from someone's face. But <laughs> if you do it again, you might knock yourself out. So, Yeah, yeah I... Yeah, I have. I agree with you. I agree with you. But it, it was satisfying, like the first one. The it second was. one was like, oof. I was afraid he was going to like sure. bash his head on his teeth. I'm like, yeah, oh, you're going to cut yeah, your face open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, after the fight and Burns skull being bashed on the ground, Tommy has a really heartfelt moment with Grace, which is perhaps like the the scene stealer, the uh, the episode stealing scene mm-hmm. where he's asking Grace, why did she shoot? Yeah. So you feel like at this point these these two characters are as close as they've ever been. Yeah. They they are. I mean uh, they, they they both, you know, have remarks of, "Oh, oh, you you seen me. Oh, you seen me now." They, yeah, yeah. And honestly like this is like the pivoting mo- this moment moment for me with Grace. Right? Really? Yeah, you begin to like her more at this point? Yeah. Because she it, it feels like she's putting up less of a facade. Um and, and I don't know. The, the character development after this point with her I I just think is is really good. 
Well, it is really like they've seen each other. I, I mean, what's more seeing somebody than when they're fight? If you see them fight for survival, exactly. I mean, that's kind of like the most. It's the most animalistic, you know, away. bit of you. Yeah. Which, which yeah, the exactly. copper also says here. <laughs> Looks yeah. like he was killed by well, a wild effing animal. Yeah, and you gotta love the cops here. They show up after everything has been done mm-hmm. for them, and they go and take out the bodies. Like you gotta just love these crooked cops in this show. They're terrific. Oh yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. They're literally outside, by the way. So they obviously heard all the gunshots. Purpose, yeah, they they on purpose did not go in there on time. They wanted to see whoever won won because even if Tommy died, they don't that's care. another headache rid rid of for them. Yeah. And then they get the IRA members. So it's a two birds with one stone exactly. type of situation, right? No matter what happens, they're gonna win something in this situation. Yeah, yeah. It's well, it's actually the better scenario for them would have been if the IRA members killed him. I agree. Right? Yeah. And then they also get to arrest the IRA members because then you get the guns because unless he didn't write the right location of the guns there. But you probably would have had them anyways because Grace already knew the location of the graveyard, right? Yeah, but if they killed Tommy, they would have killed Grace in, I, from, well, in my opinion. For sure. they Yeah, they would have killed Grace. But if there was no banter, like there should not have been banter, then Tommy should be dead and Grace would have been out there too late. She gets one shot in and then t- she holds Tommy while he dies in her arms. This mm-hmm. probably what should have happened if Tommy didn't have any plot armor. Yeah. But uh <laughs> but he does, so it is what it is. And could you imagine the show without Tommy with Arthur leading the Peaky Blinders? <laughs> It'd be a short lived yeah. series. We might get to it season two. It, <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have been re up. The, the season dies no. in season one. Oh man. Yeah. The series dies. Anyways, um as that whole scene plays out, Tommy and Grace walk back to their place. The cops clean up the scene. Um, and you can see here, Tommy walks Grace home and I think she's expecting him to come inside and kind of like, I think she was trying to get it on with Tommy, to be honest with you in this scene. It's kind of like you share trauma with somebody and you're just like, Uh, you you know, all right, we've seen each other. Now I really want to see each other. Yeah, exactly. trying to say. Hey, you know, but there's a little wink in there. Yeah. But Tommy is actually, uh, he's a decently pure hearted individual. I know people are going to probably scoff at that. Yeah, but you, <laughs> I you, almost you did. T- you, you can tell he's guilt-ridden when he walks her home mm-hmm. because um, he doesn't go inside. And you could just kind of tell that he feels maybe he feels guilty he's defiled her. Yeah. I think, yeah, he feels guilty and he feels kind of like that he defiled this good girl into killing someone, you know? Yeah. Killing someone for him, even worst of all. That's true. In a situation that he probably didn't want to involve her in. If right? only he knew this was the second man she's killed in, like... A couple yeah, months. I, I like when he says I'm sorry and just walks away. And that's just like the the shot. It's just a Yeah. You know what this scene kind of reminds me of? Hmm. But less so because they don't have like a romantic moment here is uh remember Casino Royale, Daniel Craig and mm-hmm. uh I think the actress Ava Green. I think. And um she kills someone for him and she's traumatized by it. Oh she's yeah. In, he the, goes the to the room shower and she's scene. Yeah, she's yeah. in the shower and she's like, I, "It's on my hands. I can't get it off." Yeah. And he starts to like sucker, sucker fingers. Yeah, that was that's kind of like the <laughs> that was a fantastic. Like, I mean, first and foremost, Casino Royale is the best. It is of it, all the Bond incredible. films, um, or at least of Daniel Craig's. Bond I was gonna say maybe it, yeah. all of them. I'd say maybe all of them for sure. It's up there. It's up there. Name one better. I don't have them all on you the top you tip can't of my name tongue. One better. Casino Royale is the best of it, all it time is, of all It is James really, really good. I, Quantum of Solace yeah. is not that great. Casino Royale, I think, is... It's it's definitely... If it's not the best, it's going to be, like, second. Mm-hmm. James Bond is, like, uh, an absolute uh, pleasure to watch, especially during Christmas time when you do, like, yeah. a whole marathon. They used to have them on Spike TV. I actually 25 just... 25 Days of Bondsmas or whatever. I just bought all of the James Bonds on uh, on Apple TV, so I officially own them all now. Favorite Bond and least favorite Bond. Go. Favorite Bond and least... Oh, uh, my least favorite Bond is Living Daylights. I freaking hate that one. Who's that? The no, Liv- not Bond movie. Bond, like literal Bond actor. Oh, okay. Not the movie, the actor. I mean, favorite Bond is... It's between Daniel Craig and Sean Connery, but I think it's going to go to Daniel Craig. Least favorite Bond... Oh, God. Who all was there? I mean, there's Sean Connery, Daniel Craig, Pierce Brosnan... Um, Roger Moore. Roger Moore. Timothy Dalton. I think Timothy Dalton was probably one of my least favorites. I would actually have to say Timothy Dalton's in the top three. He's he was only in one or two Bond films, right? 
I mean, let me. My favorite. I'm gonna go with Daniel Craig as my favorite, but sh- it it was Sean Connery. But mm-hmm. Craig revived the series because okay. I really do think Pierce Brosnan was a pretty boy Bond. And uh, yeah, I didn't. I wasn't a big along, fan of Pierce Brosnan because of that. Yeah, he was he was more along the lines of like a Roger Moore Bond, who I also didn't like his films. Oh. Uh, with Bond, so really my the Bonds that I enjoy to watch are the Sean Connery. And um and Daniel Craig once and Timothy Dalton does have one yeah, as well but Timothy Dalton um, isn't isn't my least favorite I I just looked up all of you know those who have played uh, him and my least favorite is is actually between um David Niven and George Lazenby and I think George that's Lazenby is right my least favorite. George Lazenby was like awful yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely hated that one I'm sorry I don't want to like only cr- one, I don't know who this guy is but, but you know I don't want to absolutely good. trash him but. I, I would have to say Roger Moore, but then again, some people actually do love Roger Moore Bond films. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, for, yeah, for yeah, me, yeah. for me, it's it's Daniel Daniel Craig, Sean Connery, and then you know Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan. They're they're, they're kind of tied up for like, me. I, I think I just I, thought I, the Roger Moore Bonds were like so cookie cutter. You know what I mean? Like yeah, and and the Sean Connery ones are more rough around the edges. I feel like Daniel Craig kind of just channeled a, a Sean Connery type with his. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. Anyways, back to Peaky. Yeah. That was a nice side tangent. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> After after the whole uh, bar situation with the IRA members and Grace killing the man and Tommy walking her back home, Grace meets with Campbell and asks for her resignation and essentially tries to pull a deal with Campbell where she'll give him the location for the guns if he pretty much gives immunity to Tommy of all crimes that yeah. he has committed with this stolen guns. What's his right? safety, man? Yeah, well, uh, I think Campbell at this point is really onto her as far as like her being in love with Tommy, and uh, his inferiority complex is raging. It's like bubbling up. He has this his temple vein is blown. It's just bulging out of the side of his head. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of Campbell here? I know he's one of your favorites. He even grabs her hand. Here. <sighs> he it it. I don't I don't know. I just don't like it. He's way too old for her first of all so like there's this weird like father daughter dynamic think... and then at the same time he's yeah. like head over heels for her and the, the fact that he knows her well, because he let's his think father this. served with him right like so that adds to it like he's more of like a father figure in her life but he's trying to hook up with her i mean i don't know i don't know about gonna... you but like it, 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 if if you had a daughter and i wasn't married and we were older yeah, yeah. Huh? it'd be like right. me trying to hook up with your daughter this would be a little relax, weird bro. relax let me at least hook up with your daughter <laughs> i don't like i don't like this flip scenario with you and my daughter that's weird bro it's weird let's keep each other's daughters out of this shit that's fine anyway <laughs> any, any future ones <laughs> all right look um i'm actually going to tear apart your argument right here okay uh by saying this if tommy shelby and campbell swapped ages but kept the same personalities does Young Campbell get grace or does old Tommy get grace? You know, I think I that would argument. I think that would even the playing field a little bit though. No right? way, hey, Tommy wins that man. It's like Pete Campbell versus Don Draper. Like it's not gonna <laughs> end well for Pete. It's true. It's you know? it's true. But the key difference here is look, he even has the same man. last name, Pete Campbell. It's is Campbell. It, yeah. <laughs> well, it's Campbell's first name here. Uh, the yeah, the yeah, big yeah. difference is. It's just the fact that he acts like such a father figure to her, and it, it, it's that. I don't think. I, I, I don't it's, think I Campbell's his first name, by the way. You know what? I don't think Campbell's his first name. Oh, no, he's not. I don't know what it is then. I mean, it's Inspector, it's, uh, Inspector Campbell. Campbell. I don't think it would. Yeah, be it like might not be his Inspector first name. Might be right. yeah. Maybe this is Pete right, Campbell's uh, like great great grandfather or something. You imagine it would make so much sense. Yeah. It would make so much sense. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> you get a nice, a neat little montage after this where Campbell uh, bullshittingly uh, agrees to giving Tommy immunity. Yeah. You know that's no good. The moment no. that he says yes to that, right? Yeah. <laughs> the moment he says yes to that, you just know it's BS. Mm-hmm. But uh, we get a montage of Grace singing, Campbell digging out the grave that uh, Grace gave up to him um, with the guns. And by the way, I do not remember those guns being in the grave. I, I do not remember that. I wasn't surprised when I saw it. I like. I feel like I, I I knew that all along. Once I saw them digging it up, we also get a get a glimpse of Arthur here getting let down. And getting what? Getting let down. I mean, he's just sitting there drinking a beer, waiting for his dad, who never shows up. 
Yeah, what a what are the odds of that? That's crazy. All right. That's a uh, that's a nice looking gun. It's a little scary yeah. looking. I think that's like an old style uh Tommy gun or like Gatling gun. Type yeah, it's a, it's, I think it's a Gatling gun. You know, Tommy in this episode really lets himself just fall for Grace. You see like the facial expressions on his face when Grace is singing in the bar. Mm-hmm. It goes from no singing in this bar to standing by the door and kind of just like smiling like that guy when you know you're just hopelessly in love and you're just yeah. smiling you know he just has that look on his face yeah what tommy's doing is the modern day when you look at your phone and you smile at the text type mm-hmm. of thing that's what he's doing here with gray singing in the bar yeah uh can gray sing a happy song by the way i don't think so i don't think it's in her nature it's one of <laughs> these songs we'll see maybe yeah. maybe she does i don't know anyways right now you know we're at a point where where grace ends up meeting campbell at the graveyard when they when they dug up the uh did he find all the, the guns, guns in that grave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they dug out the all guns but one. There was just one missing. Oh, I don't know which one, but one was missing apparently. Interesting, interesting. But anyways, it's here that Grace actually asks for her resignation or gives her resignation because, you know, their mission is complete, as she puts it. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. They they they've completed what they came here for, and Campbell, like a f- fool who's just completely clueless. Sims. proposes to her and yeah exactly in a in the middle of a graveyard <laughs> in a graveyard yeah, yeah and, and like... she, she's, <laughs> she turns her down i and didn't she's notice like, that before he, he has a line here and he's like what is it the the, the he, i love he how he right tells here. you you deserve better yeah you deserve better while he proposes to her in a literal cemetery yeah he says something is it him between us or is it the the beast uh that we dug a grave or something like that uh, i don't know exactly what he said but he calls uh tommy the beast who dug the grave yeah man he when he loses it and goes him it's you know mm-hmm. not a good look no not a good not, look, not really all right so we get the sad scene of arthur going to <laughs> the train station to try to catch up with his father who is talking to two random women who Maybe you're ladies of the night, but I think they are dressed with bonnets and stuff like that. They don't look well, like that's how you hide. But, uh, yeah, but why would he be talking to anybody who's not a lady of the night? You know, that's true. That's true. That's true. But um, Arthur confronts him for abandoning him again. And his dad really shows his true colors here, which mm-hmm. everyone else can see. But Arthur has to learn He's the hard way, unfortunately. Yeah. Arthur is like the. Um, what's the word I'm trying to say? He's. He's pure of heart. Right? Yeah. I don't I don't know if I would put it that way. He's not because of the acts he's done. Yeah. But think about it. He's just a little boy here. He's just a little boy here who needs his father. That's really all he is. Yeah. And his dad, man, he hits him with one of those lines where he throws him against the wall and he says, I'll cut your throat open and splay you out here on these tracks. Yeah. Damn bro. Like, <laughs> it's it's pretty dang dad. intense. I don't yeah. think I've ever had a conversation that intense. Yeah. <laughs> this year. Yeah. Not in the prize ring now. I feel like Conor McGregor might have like, like him. This guy kind of has the you charisma know, that, of Conor McGregor. That's who he reminds me of. Like, like if yeah. he reminded me of anybody else, it's Conor McGregor. Yeah, yeah. Does uh? So they pan down with the camera here, and there's like a puddle on the floor. Oh, did oh. Arthur? Did Arthur soil himself here? I don't think he pissed himself. It, uh, it looks like he just walked through it. I mean, it looked more like they were just panning down to the hat, potentially. But I don't know. I don't know. Man. It just I, looked like I that looked like a lot of liquid. That felt for... like something like deeper there. Like there's like some sort of psychological depth there with what happened to Arthur. I mean, in this and, this uh, scene right here where he's looking at Polly, he does kind of look like somebody who just pissed himself. He he looks like a little boy who's been reprimanded. Yeah. That's what he looks like here. Which he just was. He? Like it's literally what just happened. Yeah, he just looks like yeah, somebody with got Paul their ass specifically. Whooped. He was just abused by his dad, but now he's being like reprimanded by the the loving mother mm-hmm. of sorts, right? Yeah. Um, which you know, not a great, not great timing <laughs> here to kind of double down on making him feel like shit. Oh yeah, right. Um, you want to talk about this really empowered and uh, uh, righteous speech of Campbell here? Oh yeah, it's great. I mean, we we cut to uh to Campbell talking to the other police officers on the force here, and he's just basically talking about how. You know, they, they got the guns, they, they, they completed this, this mission, right? But there's still one thing that, uh, that that's left unfinished, right? It's Tommy. 
So mm-hmm. they want He wants to go after Tommy, and he gets he gets pretty uh, violent with his words here, very violent with his words, and uh, and descriptive here. And he ends up ending ending his little speech here with what was it? An amen. He ends it with an amen. Like he literally, like his speech was like a prayer. Yeah, the whole thing. Like like it, as if what he's saying is something that is is so holy and and righteous and correct. Yeah. And, uh, emphasizing, tr- trying to to, you know, portray everything that is the Shelbys as evil and sinful exactly. and dirty yeah. and yeah, yeah. everything. And you get this. Um, Tommy goes and visits the grave. I guess it's like a routine of his that they just kind of show in this episode. And he realizes that the guns have been taken from him. Mm-hmm. At which point he tells Finn, who's actually walking with him too, that there's going to be trouble. Yeah. And um, he tells him to go take care of himself. Well, cut uh, meanwhile, up. Arthur, Arthur goes and visits. Uh, yeah, he goes and visits the same fight ring that the episode starts at, but he shows up at closing hours and nobody wants to fight him. And yeah, they kind of make a fool of him. Arthur's having one of the worst days of life here, and uh, it gets even worse after this. Yeah, as they go to a wide shot and kind of implicate what's about to happen yeah. with the rafters above him. The, right? There's there's three men that were here anyways. It was the, it was the one big fat guy that he tried that they were gonna try and. Uh, get a light or make make him pay a license for this uh, fighting ring he's one of them mm-hmm. and he's like mm-hmm. no they just walk away it, it, it's it's pathetic yeah well um he's having a kind of pathetic type of day so he's not really <laughs> he has given up at this point in some ways right and that was kind of like a way to regain his uh, pride in himself in some mm-hmm. ways was to go fight which kind of explains a lot of his violent side in a way uh meanwhile the kind of the day has flown past here it's nighttime tommy is uh back at the garrison and he tells grace to he has to lay low for a while Mm -hmm. you do get a sense this is like yeah tommy's not going back here with uh grace this is you know full steam ahead and uh, he even takes time on the night where the whole police force is after him to give her a message and yeah uh, he gets away at the nick of time and uh at which point campbell comes in trying to do his little victory lap over Tommy, and he gets the news that um, he probably went with Grace to her apartment, which kind of baffles me because Campbell calls off the search here yeah. for Tommy, and um, I don't know why. If he wants to humiliate and get Tommy and you know get pretty much spite Grace, then what he would do is really send the police force to Grace's house, wouldn't he? he you see, I think the thing is he still loves her, so mm-hmm. if they were if the police were to show up there, she's probably gonna get hurt, right? And yeah. And she's going to see the evil side of him, right? Yeah. First hand. Yeah. Like, like, I don't think yeah, he wants she that. Does, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I still don't get it, though, because at this point, Grace is not going to get with him. And he, everyone will know. She'll, she knows at this point that he went back on his word, right? So she thinking. already knows that he's not a man of, of honor for doing that. Uh, Finn is just the most random character ever, man. He's he's always where he should not be for the most part. It's true, and uh, he, he cannot be eleven. I just I do not remember eleven year olds looking that tiny. What did you think of that uh, dragging the gun across the bar counter uh, move from Campbell there? It was a little weird. I mean, ugh, it wasn't even also that count. intimidating. It was kind of just like to get people's attention. Also, your lead inspector putting a gun at the local barkeep's head. For information talk about uh he's leaving an imprint of the barrel on the guy's head <laughs> yeah for real talk about like a nice guy to have in charge right uh-huh yeah well he calls off the search i still don't agree with it necessarily based on his current character i just think that it's kind of like a it was needed for tommy and grace to have their moment which occurs uh very soon after which i guess campbell needs to witness like a little creep in the streets seeing tommy and grace hook up and yeah have uh probably their their sweetest moment after their <laughs> after their encounter with the ira earlier in this episode right yeah i, I wrote down that, that we have uh campbell looking like a peeping tom <laughs> a little yeah he's looking this. through the <laughs> he's looking through the curtains right yeah well i mean he's down in like the alleyway but he's looking up into the room through the uh through the curtains yeah so you can see some you shadows tell- and movement and stuff you can tell the writer of this show really likes to write for tommy because he does have some great lines where he oh, even yeah. says, like, people look different in their homes. They look off guard. Like, that's a good line. And it's actually it just, it's so true. It's it just is. so true. To see someone in their home or to see someone outside of work is such a different look for them, right? Mm-hmm. Very you really see so. kind of, who, you see that who they are. 
when you see them at home. Yeah. So um, at this point, they're kind of beating around the bush because he's being a gentleman and they're being kind of coy. Maybe they don't think it's a good idea, uh, but they both are just irresistibly attracted to each other. Yeah, you can feel the heat and, in the room here. And, and they make sweet love. Sweet <laughs> love. Do they actually dance to music? Or, yeah, they do. Uh, they, they dance, dance to, to music. Nothing? Well, no, he asked if the she had a gramophone, but it's broken. But he's like, I don't need music to dance. So he asks yeah. her to dance, and you know they they dance, and yeah, 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 yeah. He stuff. Well, like you get that, the whole, right? the whole montage here, and the whole episode's going really nicely here because the search is off. There's no more danger to Tommy at this point mm -hmm. that we can see of at this point. Yeah. And um, after they're you know, the next uh, morning after, <sighs> you get all right. In my opinion, the culmination of everything has been leading up to this episode, yeah. or bubbling up in this episode which is grace is kind of that piece tommy has been looking for mm -hmm. he he admits that he doesn't hear the shovels against the wall which is and he's smiling i haven't seen tommy smile this yeah, much is, all season it is almost one of, it's one of the first memorable smiles you've seen yeah yeah he's smi he's smiling all over this episode yeah so grace has got him on cloud nine but he essentially this to me is like tommy's proposal to grace mm -hmm. he wants her like her help with with life everything yeah so um and you can see in her eyes she's conflicted because she's pretty much betrayed him in some ways, right? Yeah. But she doesn't meet him unless she's betraying him. So True. She's got some she has some confrontations that are gonna be needed to <laughs> she, be quelled. She's gonna have to come clean about something here. Yeah, exactly. Uh well, as we know on Peaky, uh things tend to have a dark a dark turn in some ways and so while they're making love, the symbol of making life arthur's actually trying to take his own life yeah and he's in the same fighting ring he fought his father and pretty much giving up the fight by taking the fighter's stool the boxer's stool mm -hmm. a lot of symbolism here he's taking the fighter's stool hanging up his boots and uh tries to hang himself on the rafter or actually on the hook here on the rafter yeah but um one thing i remember in this scene because this is probably my third time watching this episode um in general mm -hmm. throughout my course of watching peaky blinders I don't remember this scene being as hopeful as it was. Did you catch that? What do you mean as hopeful as it was? I mean, it was very depressing, but at the same time, the music, because it's a failed suicide attempt when the, when the rope snaps on the hook. Yeah. And I, I remember when I watched this the first time, I was like, no, because Arthur is, you know, clearly the second favorite oh, yeah, in the he, show, he, right? He's great. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> yeah, I know. I was, I was kind of bummed yeah. when, when I started seeing this the first time as well. But yes. no, I, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't think anything uplift lifting of it, right? Like it, it just you never notice. You never notice. I'm gonna rewind that because we actually do the way we do these episodes is me and Zach watch the episodes beforehand and then we play it live while we're actually doing these recaps. Yeah. But listen closely, Zach. I'm actually gonna put the volume up a bit here, All right, go so ahead. you can hear the music for ten seconds prior mm -hmm. and see what I'm talking about uplifting because it's kind of like a Mumford and Sons type of vibe yeah, to the song. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you hear this just heavy kind of like lower note on the on the guitar that's very uplifting when mm. the, the rope snaps it's like a second chance of life for arthur mm. i'm just gonna play it all right when he hits the floor yeah ah oh, yeah yeah you do hear it it's kind of like hitting the, the low note on a piano yeah uh-huh it gets uplifting after that it's not heavy and somber up at that point yeah that's that's true i mean i, I don't yeah. i wasn't trying to analyze it as much the first time it was more just kind of the fact that he's gonna kill himself <laughs> yeah well it's but, you yeah. know it also feels like kind of some divine intervention too doesn't it yeah it does i mean it's the uh because that rope was pretty thick it was it didn't thick. feel like that was the kind of rope to, no, to snap like a heavy looking jump rope or something yeah 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 well um the one of the final things you see in this episode is like this nice sunlight hitting Grace and Art uh, and Tommy, mm -hmm. and um, Campbell's making a telegram to Churchill telling him he's gonna leave town. Mission's been accomplished, but uh, he's got one more matter to attend to, which is you would assume taking down Tommy. Yeah, right. That's that's what I would expect. Yeah. Tommy eventually finds out that Arthur tried to hang himself and has a moment of just uh, cheering up his brother, really, and. Uh, Opens it up with the line you would expect where he says, you should have used a gun. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. You, you got to love yeah. this. I mean, Tommy 
Tommy walks in and he's making fun of Arthur because he's trying to kill himself and mm-hmm. he's like, "Oh, you're always trying to screw things up when things are getting good. Should have used the gun." Yeah, and it shows him. And uh, he tells him. Yeah, he tells him how things are getting good too. I mean, yeah, he has made the business officially uh, in paper, in writing business for him, John, and Arthur are equal equal partners in Shelby Company Limited, mm-hmm. right? By law. But he makes another joke. He says, hey, but next time, if you're going to try to kill yourself again, use a gun. Because me and John would be more than happy to split your share with each other. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. Um, I was going to say something here in this in this scene. Uh, Tommy, in his own way, knows how to cheer up his brothers. I mean, it's not going to be like a coddling, why'd you do that? Yeah, exactly. You know, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And Polly, with all of her resentment of Tommy, at the end of the day, knows... The family moves by Tommy. Mm-hmm. That's it. And so she tells him about his brother who tried to kill himself because ultimately when you want stuff done in the Shelby family, you call Tommy Shelby. That's yeah, what you call. Of course. You call him. Even if you think he betrayed Freddie Thorne, you call Tommy. <laughs> right? Well, you get this really upbeat ending to this episode because Tommy's under the impression that Campbell's leaving town. And it's pretty much roads are clear for them to elevate in the world. Mm-hmm. What do you think of this transition here? I really like this shot that transitions out from Arthur and and Tommy. Polly's coming down the stairs, and you get probably the most upbeat, optimistic little ending montage yeah. of uh, of the Shelby Family Company Limited here. Mm-hmm. This is a, like bright light coming in from every window. Tommy's reading the newspaper in peace. Uh, everyone's counting money. It's flowing in on the tables. Yeah, and uh, it's legit. And it business. ends. Yeah. It's legitimate business, and he's reading the newspaper like a legitimate businessman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, he's just pretty much looking on with pride yeah. at his company the scene before is awesome. he walks out into the light. It's also a lot brighter. Like It's a lot cleaner. You know, you have this a massive amount of sunlight leaking in through the window. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's foggy as crap in here, but... It almost feels like a dream, yeah. right? The way it is. It's just so bright and smoky in the room. Yeah. Tommy's smiling again. The Probably the biggest smile of the episode so far. Yeah. He's so got that morning after Pops with Grace, Grace Energy yeah. going on right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Finn's coming in with money in the hat. Even Finn's raking in the cash. Everything's good in peaky land. And this sun is just blaring through the doors as yeah. Tommy walks out into the light and end Fade of episode light. five. Yeah, it was... Uh... It's interesting. You know, we get this nice bright shot to end it out with. Well, director of this episode was Tom Harper. Tom Harper. Which we should keep a, a lookout for him mm-hmm. as uh, we would have a, what was I going to say? A look into what kind of episodes he directs and how those are. Because yeah. if you notice in TV shows, it's never the same director for each episode. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's one of those things where you tend to like certain directors when you see their name on the on it you're like oh yeah it's tom harper yeah you know, like, i love his episodes exactly well anyways that was a much better episode than i recall yeah but uh favorite uh hit us with the categories what'd you say hit us with the categories oh, My, uh, I, I gotta drink some water here i am so i'm gonna much. i'll bring them up right now first uh starting out is best scene i have two written down i have okay. a feeling they're I've gonna overlap based down. on the way you were talking earlier on i've got three all right i've got three written down um do you want me to go first yeah you go first, you go first. I'll ask a question you go first. i think uh there's several really s- great scenes in this episode mm-hmm. i think the first encounter with burn um is a great scene i think the actual showdown with the ira members and that moment with grace and tommy mm-hmm. of you've seen me that scene is yeah. great i think uh grace and tommy uh finally uh getting together was great and uh i also liked tommy talking to arthur after his failed suicide attempt Mm. as as my final favorite scene of the episode that that is a good third one yeah i mean the two that i wrote down was basically you know burn confronting tommy he just he kind of stole the shot stole the scene Mm -hmm. and then you know finally uh he's not a character you want to around long but uh i I also liked uh the battle with uh grace and tommy versus the two ira men burn and, and the uh yeah. The singer that's lost his thirst. I was a little disappointed that Byrne was killed off so fast because he had such potential to be a good adversary to Tommy that it, it felt um, – it's not that it, it did feel right that he died, but 
that one encounter, I had, I would have to assume I got to look up that actor. Or if Jimmy can, if you can look that up for us, because um, hmm. I would imagine that just based off of those couple of scenes, that he went on to making some really great work, or he got some really good roles after this. We don't have to, Jimmy. Don't we'll find out next episode. We'll, we'll find. Out. Oh, I mean, uh, he he just told me he's telling me right oh, now. Know? Yeah, the name of of the actor is Tom Vahan Lawler. Lawler, okay, what, what kind of like what has he done since being in Peaky? Uh, let me, let me see. What what was that? What, um, like, okay. what has he been in since being in Peaky? Yeah, uh, I mean, it sounds like he's he's been in Avengers, uh, Infinity War, Endgame, movie called The Infiltrator, Danny Boy, uh, a few things. Hold on, say that again. Say that again. Uh, Avengers. Infinity okay, War that's huge. and Endgame. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's huge. The Infiltrator. That's huge. as Brian Cranston. Yeah, and um, he was in Danny Boy, which is... Danny Boy doesn't sound familiar. Yeah, is that a TV play movie? Is that it's a, a TV movie. It's, it's, uh, okay. it's really recent. Let's see. Going down the list. Uh, that's, that's about all the big ones that he's been on, honestly. He hasn't been in a lot else. Not even before, before Peaky. I mean, he's only been in a few things like maybe he's uh, more of a of a um of a theater actor maybe yeah he might be he might be you know cillian murphy does a lot of uh or he was doing a lot of i think he does theater acting as well interesting he's a real he's a real thespian interesting. cillian murphy <laughs> big time he's actually gonna be the lead in uh christopher i don't know if you've talked about this but he's gonna be the lead in uh nolan's new film about uh, oppenheimer he's actually playing the lead there i and, think i've um, heard about that it's the biggest budget film ever, I think. Dang. Ever. And um, should be incredible. He's always been in Nolan films, but uh, he's always played a supporting actor. <laughs> and uh, for the most part, and not the leads. So it's, And I always found that interesting because I think what Peaky Blinders did for Cillian Murphy was... I think it put him in the, in the leading man light again because he literally carries Peaky Blinders. Yeah. And uh, it shows that he is a top-notch actor. Like, he is up there with anybody out there right now. Anybody. Mm -hmm. And um, he's serious about his craft. Like, he's, like, legit. No, you never hear about some, you know, BS with Cillian Murphy. He just loves acting. He doesn't care for the fame, I think, that comes no, with No, he it. doesn't. He hates like, social media. I mean, I, yeah. I hear him on interviews all the time talking about that. He's like, uh, yeah. make yourself sound boring so people don't, don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, that's the one way to do it, so... All together, I take back everything I said about episode five. Excellent episode. One of the best of the season, if not the best of the season. And I think really just my distaste for their father kind of overruled the actual episode being great. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. La last, uh, last question I have or category is, you know, most memorable characters. I actually have three written down on this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what are yours? I didn't write down most memorable, like, or who stole the show type of character mm -hmm. in, in this episode. But I would have to say it's the IRA members mm. who stole the show because they just came out of nowhere and really left an imprint, specifically yeah. Burn. Yeah. So I'm going to go with them on, on my answer. So the, the three that I wrote down was, was Arthur, just because, I mean, again, like, this was an episode where we, where we got to see some character development with him and, you know, him meeting his dad and, like, this, this whole dynamic that was pretty weird but you know it, it's interesting to see um grace because you know that like okay, this, this yeah, is this is a pivotal point, moment for grace I, I think in my opinion at least and then the obvious the ira man uh burn in the garrison yeah i you know funny thing with arthur in this episode is like you see tommy has to overcome certain things in his life right where campbell is a, a literal physical personable obstacle towards his goals mm -hmm. and he overcomes that in this episode for the most part yeah arthur has to overcome his relationship in with his father and he overcomes that in this episode yeah not by his own making because if he had his own making he'd be dead yep but he seems like his life's on an upward path now with having that second chance yeah. so i'm looking forward to the season finale on our next episode and uh getting into season two because we got four more seasons to catch up before uh for the new season. I don't think we're going to catch up before the new season, but I think, I don't uh, think, so I think either, we'll make but, decent uh, headway. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, Zach, 
you're the outro king so hit us i am the outro king well anyways thank you for listening to episode five of season one of the peaky blinders podcast by story archives uh you can find this podcast basically anywhere you listen to podcasts apple Podcasts, spotify google Podcasts. you can probably find us other places but those are the main ones you can visit a website at storyarchives.themidnightexchange.com we also have an instagram handle story archives uh rightfully named um and then you know we also have uh the midnight exchange.com which is the website of our uh podcast network so you can you can go look them up there's a whole bunch of social media handles there there's a, there's a podcast there as well you can listen to uh but if you if you happen to have any suggestions thoughts or again maybe you want to be a uh, a special guest on here you want to do a bonus episode or maybe you're a domain expert in something here a historian i, I don't know uh drop us an email at podcast at the midnight exchange.com and you know we'd, we'd love to to have you on i, I love, love it. it thank you guys for tuning in once again and until next time stay peaking